Good afternoon, I'm Andrea Elbers. We are interrupting ABC programming right now to bring you live coverage of a press conference just getting started in Minnesota. The governor there, Tim Walls, is expected to talk about the state's plan to allow bars and restaurants to reopen in Minnesota. He's speaking in St. Paul. Let's listen in. Outside, um, I think today is that day that many of us wait for after a winter. Uh, late, late spring with a touch of uh, summer on it. And um, it seems almost unimaginable to many of us uh, that in the past three months, um, by the end of this month, uh, 100,000 of our fellow Americans will have died to COVID-19, a, uh, a novel coronavirus that we just started hearing about in, in December, and that by the end of the month, 1,000 Minnesotans will have died. So it's, uh, the contrast could not be greater. Um, we're here today to, to talk about what do we do moving forward? How do we make sure, and it's so maddening, I know that there's, uh, there's so many things about this uh, virus that are unpredictable, but there's certain things that are predictable. I stood in front of you a week ago when we crossed 500, and I told you that probably on the 28th or the 29th of the month we would cross 1,000. There's just some predictability on infection rates, and, and epidemiologists talk to us about. But the one thing is that we can control is how we act what we do and in the last three months our whole purpose was is to make sure that those who will get sick and they will get sick because we have no therapeutics and no vaccine that when they do get sick they have the capacity to be able to go to the hospital and we have all of the things that they need and that we're trying to protect those most vulnerable so um, I just want to acknowledge that on a beautiful day where our students should be thinking about wrapping up the year where baseballs should be being hit in the backyard and uh, and folks should be gathering together. Um, this year is unlike any we've ever seen and those challenges are immense. Um, I'd also like to say that we spent a lot of time thinking about how do we find a new normal? How do we make sure, as we've talked many times, the health, safety, economic, and mental and physical well-being of Minnesotans is our top priority. Working with healthcare experts, working with the economists, working with businesses. Um, and these things are hard. I wish I could tell you that there was a perfect answer. I wish I could tell you that the ones we have are absolutely right. Um, but what we've seen, there's not a playbook. Um, I, I guess CDC put out a reopening guide today. But what we've seen is, is when the first one came out, um, there's really no states meeting those and then we're told not to. Um, there's been a lot of ships and starts here in Minnesota. We took the seriously that states were going to be responsible for this. We needed to stand up and figure out our own testing plan. I was on the phone today with the CEO of a um, company called Hologic, which I had never heard of before this, but I know very well now, um, like Thermo Fisher and others, Roche, uh, and trying to figure out what happened to our seven Hologic Panthers, which are high throughput uh, testing kits that are part of our strategy. Um, those are the types of things that are happening every day to try and make sure that we can do those things we told Minnesotans about. So I'm here today to talk about how we move forward with our Stay Safe Minnesota plan. As of Monday, we lifted the stay at home order. And from the very beginning, on clear back in the middle of March when we talked about the, the state of emergency, to the end of March when we did our first stay at home order, it's very clear to me that we were not going to be able to shelter in place the entire time of this uh, pandemic. That we were going to have to figure out ways that we could live with it. And I think the two analogies that I really like, um, we're not trying to prevent this uh, pandemic. We're not even, the, 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 we're trying to prevent the infections from the most vulnerable, but it's like that boiling pot that we know it's gonna boil. If we wanted to turn down the heat and keep everybody in their house so that it wasn't even simmering, um, that comes at a heck of a cost. It comes at an economic cost. It comes at a, host, a cost to uh, those elective surgeries and all those things. If you let it go on its own, it will boil over and it will overwhelm the healthcare system. Somewhere in there, there is a line where the pot just gets to simmer right before it boils. And what that allows you to do, to do as many of the economic things that you can do in a normal life without crossing that line. And today we're here to talk about um, some of those things we're going to do. And we want to just acknowledge uh, to try and give as much um, consistency and predictability as we can in a very unpredictable environment to those small business owners. But I want to make clear on this. These health guidelines are not an impediment to opening our economy. They're the key to opening the economy. As we've seen in states that have opened up, reservations for restaurants in Georgia are only 15% of what they were before. 
consumers are going to make the choice. Consumers are going to go back where it's safe. And for each and every one of us, it's our choice on how we act that is going to impact others' health and how we get through this. So on June 4th, we're going to enter phase two of our Stay Safe plan. It's going to allow outdoor dining at restaurants and bars and a measured reopening of salons, barber shops with limited capacity. June 1st, I'm sorry. Um, thank you for that. I misspoke. Um, we're going to have Steve and, and Commissioner uh, Malcolm do a little bit more on that on June 1st. Restaurants and bars, I just want to speak to all those folks. They're integral, not just to our economy, and we know now how many jobs they create. They're integral to the part of us that makes uh, living in Minnesota so great. They're the places where we had first dates. They're the places where we celebrate our anniversaries. They're the places where we gather together on special moments, um, and they make life just a little bit better. And so um, that industry has been hurting amongst all others. Commissioner Grove will talk to you about that. They're fixtures for us. The virus won't allow business as usual, but I think it's going to do our best after a Minnesota winter to get out and be able to enjoy these things. Steve will talk about some of the specifics around that. So it's the local brewery or Juicy Lucy or a walleye dinner. Minnesotans are going to be able to get back out there, try and make sure we're, uh, we're supporting these local businesses. And while it's not perfect, it's safe and it's moving the dial. I also want to thank the salons and barber shops. Uh, I know Minnesotans, and I have to be candid, it's, it's certainly not a top priority for me because I'm a bit challenged in this area, um, but this is a big area. This is a, these are a lot of small business owners. They're very successful, and once again, it's a part of what makes being human and life just a little bit better. People enjoy doing this. It's something that needs to be done, and these are a lot of entrepreneurs who knew that they were, uh, had to do the right thing and, and were not able to do their uh, their trade. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to do cautiously turn that dial back to normal. You'll need to make a reservation, wear a mask, wash your hands. Um, certainly don't go in there if you're sick. We are encouraging people to uh, uh, at these uh, barber shops take temperatures of people if you have that capacity, but certainly there will be uh, protocols in place for social distancing capacity in them. Situations fluid. We're still learning more and more every day. Um, I said we're prepared to turn the dial back. Uh, once again, Jan will talk to you about this. If we hit those hospital capacity numbers, we saw a big spike yesterday. Today, they're way down again. We saw a spike in ICUs. Those have rolled back down again. So it is not one or two days. It takes a longer pattern. We still do not know yet the effects of what we did on Monday of retails. We will not see that probably till about June 1st. And there's a reason in our timing on this because the epidemiologists and the health experts say it takes us about two weeks to 21 days to be able to see the effects of what we did on how it's changing that. So at this point in time, to say that the spikes that showed up yesterday because we opened on Monday, that's not true. Um, if we see two weeks down the road that things have changed dramatically, we might be able to make that, uh, that judgment. So um, I'll tell you what, what we keep looking at with all the data that's out there are just a few things when people say, why this over this? And I want to acknowledge again, this is not a perfect science. Um, it, it takes a lot of data. It takes a lot of uh, balancing one against another, but there are exceptions to every one, and I'll be the first to acknowledge that that becomes very, very difficult. But the way we think about these things is, is that what impacts transmission is how close you are to another person, how long you're around that other person, and how predictable the setting is that you're around that other person. And so if we know you're standing here, the other person is standing six feet or more apart. You're going to be there for less than a minute, and that that is the way that transaction happens every time. That's very predictable. And those were many of the things that came open in the first place. When you have people moving around, doing different things, you don't know who's there, you don't know who's coming, uh, you set for a long period of time, those things become much more unpredictable, and the transmission rates go up uh, pretty exponentially. So I have to... Uh, once again, reiterate, the safety and security of Minnesotans is the top priority of any governor who served. Um, that is certainly true now. That extends to thinking about how do we find that new normal and restart Minnesota's economy, or I should say grow it from where it is because many folks are back out there. And how do we do it in a manner where we're able to measure very clearly how much that pot is simmering and how close it is to getting to boiling? Because the problem that you have is if you miss that line, um, it becomes very, very difficult. And so I want to um, let our two commissioners who were instrumental in helping put this together for the June 1st stay uh, safe Minnesota, but understanding you've got 
two other commissioners in here today. You have literally thousands of people who interacted. I want to give a thank you um, to the trade organizations, uh, Bruce and Liz, who are up here from Hospitality Minnesota, um, from the retailers. Those folks have worked with us and told us what our businesses can do. And then I guess I have to speak directly to Minnesotans. Again, I can't stress enough how empathizing with you how maddening this is, how frustrating it is we can't do the things we're going to do, and how challenging it is to be asked in society to have to curtail back some of the things that we want to do. But in a time of great uncertainty, how we conduct ourselves is the one thing we control. And how we conduct ourselves in terms of social distancing, masking, washing our hands, being smart, going to the hospital, getting tested, that has the biggest impact on the spread of this virus of anything that science can do or anything else that's being done. So I understand the frustrations. I understand the desire. But I simply... The science is too strong. We can't pretend like this isn't a big deal. We can't pretend with 100,000 dead Americans that this is just going to go away. We can't pretend that all of the trends of the modeling are holding pretty steady and pretty true, that we are still quite a ways off from our peak. And while the rest of the country, and if you're watching the news, may look like they're opening back up their beaches, they're opening back more things, they have come through this. And I will have to tell you about New York. They have gone through days of 500 people dying. They have 25,000 dead New Yorkers in the last three months because of COVID-19. That's a heck of a price to get on the other side of this. Our peak is still coming. Um, the difference between what New York had to go through and what we're going through is we are better prepared to hit it head on. But it doesn't mean it's going away. It doesn't mean it's going to magically disappear. We are hopeful that warmer weather slows it. We are hopeful that some of those things will happen. So Steve and Jan are going to take you through this. I know there's a million questions I hope they're able to answer from youth sports to all of those things. Um, I'll make sure that the experts who help craft this get that done, and then I'll be back for some questions. So Commissioner Malcolm, if you would. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, as the governor said, and he just did a wonderful job of explaining kind of the, the uncertain situation we find ourselves in with respect to where we are in the spread of this virus and where it may be going next in our state. As you know, um, around the world, we are getting very close to 5 million total cases of COVID-19 and 323,000 deaths around the world. In our own country, we are now at 1.5 million cases and nearly 92,000 deaths. So that forecast of 100,000 by early this summer, unfortunately, seems all too real. Here in Minnesota, we added 640 more laboratory-confirmed cases yesterday on a testing volume of, of about 5,500. Um, so that 640 brings our total to 17,670. Now, notably, this is a, a smaller rate of increase than yesterday, and indeed we've seen five consecutive days of slower rates of growth, and that's great. That's what we hope to see. Uh, that is far too soon to declare that a trend, though. As the governor said, we haven't yet seen any impacts of the, uh, of the, of the reopening measures that we've taken over the last, uh, the last periods of time, with more businesses coming online and with the lifting, uh, the transition of the stay-at-home order to the Stay Safe Minnesota order just happening on Monday. This is far too early to declare that we are on the downward slope. Indeed, as the governor said, our projections, both the, the model that was developed at the University of Minnesota, as well as data that we are sharing um, all the time with our health system partners uh, around the state, does show a lot of sensitivity in those projections to how much social movement is going on. Um, so uh, we, all of the models that we look at do still say we're on the upswing and, and anticipate the peak in Minnesota coming likely sometime in, uh, in July, but could be anywhere from late June to uh, the middle of August as far, uh, those ranges continue to be quite wide. So the, the, the relative stability of the growth rate of the cases is one of, one of the signs that tells us uh, that, that a measured approach to continuing to open our society makes sense. However, 
we have had a continued inexorable r rise in hospitalizations at a measured pace, but we are getting getting to the point where um, we know the, the load is not equally distributed around the, the various hospitals, and some of their ICUs are getting quite full. And we anticipate that some of the hospitals, and perhaps all of them, will be moving to activate their, their surge capacity in the coming weeks. So we're, we're a long way from, from finished here. In terms of the uh, hospitalizations, uh, there are currently 550 people in the hospital as of today, 212 of those in intensive care. As the governor mentioned, the, the day before, we saw a big spike of 57 new hospitalizations. Uh, yesterday, there were only five. So we, we, we just continue to be in a pattern with a lot of variation in it. Uh, which gives us a lot of pause uh, for uh, and, and concern on my part that we're not in a situation that I would call predictable in terms of where the virus is going is going next. Um, sadly, we added another 29 fatalities yesterday in Minnesota, one of our higher uh, days in terms of, uh, of people passing away from this disease. And the demography there um, continues generally to skew uh, to toward the toward the older ages, two persons over age 100, seven in their 90s, eight in their 80s, five in their 70s, 50 in their 60s, and one person in their 50s and one in their 40s. So again, this is not something that never affects uh, younger people uh, from a mortality standpoint. And the, the growth rate uh, has been concentrated um, significantly in the metro area, but as the governor's mentioned multiple times, those eight counties with foodborne, or, or excuse me, food um, production plant facilities that have been the site of some of the fastest growth in the country um, uh, on a per population basis, some of our counties do rank right up there in terms of the national totals of, uh, of rate of growth, which is another one of those caution signs for us, uh, but I'm happy to say that over the last few days, the percentage of new cases that those eight counties represent seems to be leveling off a bit. So that's the whole key to the, to the future strategy, as the governor has said time and time again, is going to be going forward our ability to find those cases quickly through testing, um, isolate them and, and do the contact, the disease investigation, the case investigations to find the people uh, who are in close contact, isolate and quarantine those folks, control those hot spots is the way that we can um, manage the continued growth of, of the outbreak in Minnesota once community spread um, is kind of at a controlled level. So that's another one of those metrics that we're really looking sharply at is what percentage of the cases have no known contact, no epidemiological link that we can make. And that's, that's, so we're looking for that community spread number to be stable, and that too has been bouncing around quite a lot. We don't wanna see that community spread percentage over 30%, and that's, we're hovering right about there. So another indicator that we are, we are not to the point of saying that the, that the, the, that this is, the danger has passed from a general community standpoint. Part of why it's so important that we keep the social distancing and that we take a very measured move today. Um, and so I really want to appreciate the robust um, discussion that we've had over the last few days and uh, the, the, the decision that the governor has come to is a cautious one. And I think it's, it's incremental and it's cautious because the, the data indicate that, that we need to continue to be cautious with this degree of community spread, this degree of case growth, the potential for outbreaks, um, and the fact that we are still building that core capacity that we need uh, to do the testing and tracing and isolation and quarantine that we need. We've uh, made great good progress. Um, our, our health system partners have in building up intensive care capacity that may be about to be um, tested uh, a little bit and the uh, personal protective equipment that remains so very important to frontline workers uh, and, and to healthcare workers uh, and to others in, uh, in close contact with, uh, with, with people that they're caring for continues to be a challenge and uh, Commissioner 
Alice Davis Roberts and her team, you know, continue to just turn over every leaf and every rock to try to build further those those uh, those supplies. So I, with that, I'm going to turn it to my colleague, Commissioner Grove, just to talk more specifically about the the moves that are being made here. I just wanted to set the context uh, within within the scope of the of today's information on the outbreak and how very important I think it is that this be a measured move, which I believe it is. Commissioner Grove. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Governor, hello, everybody. And I am here to walk through a bit more of the details on this announcement. I did want to just begin, though, by echoing the governor's sentiments and thanking our business community. This has been an unprecedented challenge for Minnesota businesses across our state, and we are very grateful for the sacrifices that they've made to help slow the spread of this disease. And I think really all of Minnesota owes our, our business community a debt of gratitude for helping us slow this spread as we've been able to prepare uh, for that peak that is coming, as the governor said. And you know, in addition to being grateful for those sacrifices, I think we've all just been very impressed by the innovation, uh, the, the community spirit that our business community has brought to this, whether it's changing their business models to create masks or PPE or other things that we desperately need, or getting really creative with how to deliver services in new ways in this new era of social distancing and, and curbside delivery and pickup and what have you. So, you know, I think it's that kind of innovation and creativity that we have seen in our business community that's going to get us through these next uh, phases of the process. So we're we're eager to continue to partner with business, as the governor said. And I, I did want to say that today is an announcement both of what is coming on June 1st, but I think also more importantly, a look at the phases that will come after that. And we really felt that it was important not only to say what's coming next, but what would the steps be after that, such that we can provide some predictability to our business community. They know what's coming next. They begin to plan out. Uh, we don't have timelines for every phase, as you'll see uh, in a moment. But we do have some phases that make logical sense from a public health perspective, from an economic perspective, that give a sense of what's on the horizon. So. Um, I uh, would encourage people to go to mn.gov slash COVID-19 and click on the Stay Safe MN tab, and you'll see a grid that lays those phases out in, in clarity. I'm going to walk through them here to give some context to it, but I think it is quite detailed and for good reason, because the details really matter in, in this moment. And so um, I'll start with the phase that is coming into effect on June 1st. And uh, the big changes the governor highlighted a moment ago focus on restaurants and bars, personal care services, uh, and campgrounds and charter boats. So I'll start with restaurants and bars. Starting June 1st, restaurants and bars can be open for outdoor dining only. Um, we have clear evidence from uh, the health experts that outdoor settings are a lot safer than indoor settings, and so we're making that move to have outdoor dining begin to become an option. Of course, six feet between tables, all the social distancing rules that have been in place from the beginning still apply. No more than 50 total people at an outdoor setting for a restaurant to keep that cap at a, at a manageable level. And then in terms of the party size, we're asking that people uh, keep it to four total or six if you're a family. So trying to limit the, the party size of folks that are restaurants, again, to try to limit the unpredictability of that environment. Uh, reservations will be required, so you can't just walk in. Um, and we're asking that all uh, workers in these settings wear masks, and we're strongly encouraging customers to wear masks too. And really, this is about the safety of workers, right? As workers come back into that environment, if customers are wearing masks, especially when they're interacting, when they're, when they're giving their order to a waiter or what have you, that does help present, prevent the spread to workers who are taking that risk to come in and serve you. So we are requiring workers to wear masks, strongly encouraging patrons to wear masks, we get it, you can't wear a mask and eat and drink, so there's some practical things here where you have to take the mask off, but having that mask when you come in, using it when you're having conversation, or moving it to eat and drink is the critical guidance. Now, obviously not every restaurant has an outdoor deck or a patio or a ready-made place to, uh, to, to sit and, and have this kind of interaction. And so we are eager to see municipalities get a little creative here and get a little innovative with restaurants to find ways to make makeshift outdoor space work. Um, we know that, that different cities have different zoning restrictions on this, and we, we ask that they get creative and find ways to make that possible for restaurants who might not have access to that space. Um, my colleagues at, at MnDOT are looking into ways to find uh, right-of-ways and sidewalks and parking spaces that might be uh, available for outdoor dining, and they'll be releasing some guidance and thoughts on that coming soon. But I think just as we've seen restaurants innovate on curbside delivery and pickup, we're going to see this new round of innovation for, for outdoor seating. And some restaurants have it, and it's part of their business model. Others will have to create it, but an important step forward to, to begin to get that dine-in happening in a safe and thoughtful manner. The second area that we're, uh, we'll be uh, 
changing as of June 1st is personal care services. This is the barbers, the, the hair salons, the nail salons, the tattoo parlors. Um, these happen generally indoors. There's not a lot of outdoor barbers out there. Um, so we do recognize it has to happen inside. Uh, but we're limiting capacity to 25%. And when I say limit capacity, it's 25% of the fire code. So every business out there has a sort of max capacity fire code. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about these percentages of, of, of the fire code. It's, it's that percentage that you, you have in your, your OSHA requirements. Um, masks are required for both the patron and the worker in this use case. Obviously, you're getting a haircut or a tattoo. There's someone, and you're pretty close. You're, you're within six feet. So wearing a mask is required for both uh, workers and clients in those settings. Appointment only, uh, no walk-ins. So 25% capacity then for personal care services. And then campgrounds and charter boats, we're also making a shift on June 1st. Uh, we're allowing those operations uh, to take place. Uh, campgrounds, um, of course, we'll need to take care to make sure that the campsite configuration is socially distant. There's common areas in campgrounds, so we got to get that right too. We have some, some clear guidelines on social distancing there and sanitation plans for these common areas. Um, you can find all that on the DNR website. Charter boats too. So uh, charter boats, uh, are allowed to resume activity with appropriate social distancing on those boats, so six feet or more between both the crew and, and the captain, unless you're all a family, and then, then it's okay to, to be close as per the, the usual guidelines. So lots more on the DNR's website there to take a look at. Um, so those are the three big changes coming on June 1st. And, and I just want to remind people sort of what remains the same, because I think that's important to know too. So the guidance that remains the same is that gatherings of 10 or less uh, are, is the limit for gatherings out and about. If you're a business that can telework, you have to telework. This is, this is a must, not a should. Telework is critical if you can get that done. And so that remains the guidance as well. Um, Non-critical businesses, uh, same thing. For retail, we're still at that 50% capacity, as we mentioned before. Uh, churches remain at uh, the same guidance as we had before, which is indoors, 10 people or less, or outdoors, 10 folks or less. Or, or drive-in services, which we've seen churches really innovate on, bringing folks into the parking lot and sitting in cars is a, a new way to get this right. And so um, we encourage churches to look into options like that. Um, and again, the rest, the rest of this is really the same. So that's, that's the June 1 guidance. But again, this is a, phase that, a phased approach that we're launching. And so I want to walk through just briefly the changes that will come in the next two phases so you get a sense of what's on the horizon. And again, no timing on this, but I know the governor wants to move as quick as we can as it relates to these stages so long as public health guidance is met and that we're being careful and doing this in a safe way. And we're going to look at that data and make the right science-based decisions uh, for Minnesota. The next phase, uh, gatherings will go up to 20 or less. Um, so that gathering limit will, will increase. Um, restaurants and bars will then move into an indoor setting as well. Uh, mask capacity will be 50% indoors with six foot of social distancing. Masks required for both workers and customers. Uh, personal care services will move to 50% as well. They went from 25 in the previous days, so, so we'll pop that up to 50. Um, and then in addition, uh, some outdoor entertainment venues will begin to open. So movies and the park and concerts and some of those great things about summer uh, will come in that phase. Again, six feet of distance, 25% capacity. We'll top that at 250, uh, just given the, the need to ensure that gathering sizes uh, remain small and socially distanced and mask requirements there too. Churches will be a part of that next phase as well. We know this is such an important issue for, for so many Minnesotans, an important part of life. And, and, and so we'll move to have uh, indoors at 10 or less, but outdoor services will be part of that next phase. So uh, it's, it's good timing because it's summer, so we'll see some outdoor services, six feet of distance between parties, max parties of, of 100 uh, uh, total, because we know that uh, for some really large churches, uh, 50 per, uh, getting that right uh, ensures that we have to keep a cap on the total number that can be there and then required masks. And then we, we got to try to do some new things here. We got to limit things like singing in those environments, which of course is just such a great part about church or celebration. But when you look at the data on the choirs that have seen just been sort of total hotspots for spread, even when social distancing existed, singing is one of the worst things that you can do, even when you're socially distant uh, from each other. So we'll have some guidelines on that too. And I'm sure uh, our, our faith leaders will get creative on those points to make sure that the celebration can still be great even with some new, new changes. Um, and that next phase as well, pools will open at a 50% capacity too. So that's what we're sort of calling phase three. Um, and then the last phase that we're uh, prepared to uh, roll out today would then be, in terms of just guidance for the future, would, would then move into things like gyms and fitness centers. Um, 
We know that a fitness center is, is, is a more risky environment given the exertion, the, the heavy breathing, um, the, the sweat and things like that. So um, gyms will come in that next phase. Um, it will be indoors and outdoors, of course, six feet of distance, uh, caps at 50 percent, masks required unless you're strenuously exercising. So kind of similar to restaurants, like you have a mask with you, you wear it whenever you can, but if you're strenuously exercising and you're eating, you don't wear it. Um, bowling alleys and movie theaters and some of the entertainment options will open in that phase as well. Social distancing, again, 25% capacity, max of 250. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll look at masks requirements there too. And then places of worship, we'll see a tick up as well. We'll, we'll go to max of 250 and, um, and some larger, we'll go indoors as well for churches in that next phase. The previous phase was outdoors, next phase will be indoors. So I've gotten into a lot of details here, and, and I realize if you're trying to write them all down, you're, you probably didn't get it all because there's a ton. I will say go to mn.gov slash COVID-19. You'll, you'll see all that information in front of you, and, and we'll have a lot more details on it for folks to, to absorb. But I did think it important just to walk through some of the, some of the key points here. And as you kind of think about that dial, it's, it's outdoors to indoors. It's capacity limits that go up over time. It's mask requirements that come into place. And it's, it's these sort of safety and, and, and guidance pieces that make uh, the advancement of those phases possible and, and practical. Um, and I'll just say that, you know, we're going to continue. We have a week and a half until June 1 starts, so we're going to be doing a lot of outreach and engagement on this. Uh, myself and my colleague, Commissioner Lepping, are holding a webinar tomorrow uh, at 11 a.m. for anybody else who wants to come and, or anybody who wants to come and sort of get some further guidance and answer questions on it. We'll do a lot more of that in the coming weeks and a half. So um, some positive changes today, some, I think, important changes for our economy that allow some businesses to get back up and, and, and running in a safe way, and then, you know, roadmap for what comes next. Uh, so that businesses can start to prepare and understand the, the order of things. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Governor. Thank you, Commissioner Malcolm and Grove. As you can hear, a, a lot goes into this, and it's, it's maddeningly complex. I know it's frustrating to all of you listening, um, but it's based on the science. It's based on, again, that very simple principle of slowing the spread of this so we don't overwhelm the, the health care system. I also want to acknowledge the balancing act that goes into this. And uh, again, I first acknowledge that uh, we certainly know we're not perfect and uh, try and measure all those things. I do want to acknowledge to the workers in this that that is a very key part that we weigh in this. Um, acknowledging that worker safety is a top priority. It's one of the reasons last week we put in the executive order protecting workers to be able to work hand in hand. I want to echo uh, Commissioner Groves uh, compliments and rightfully so to the business community of being creative and working on this. We know our business community doesn't want their workers to get sick and they're coming up with great ways to do it. I think working hand in hand with those workers who express some fear about coming back, making them comfortable. This is all about the psychology again of both the workers and the customers feeling safe to come back. Just because we say it's open, we're seeing elsewhere in the country, that doesn't necessarily mean they'll come back. The way they won't come back is if they feel that it's incredibly unsafe. And one of the reasons we have to be so careful about this if it were just an individual's choice to not wear a mask and congregate close together, that's one thing. But that action impacts the rest of society, and that's what we're trying to balance. And, and I do want to, before I go to questions, um, this issue around PPE and, and uh, trying, to, uh, trying to gather as much as we can and stockpile this, um, when my friend Mary Turner, a nurse, tells me that she's concerned about this and she's concerned in individual hospitals, I'm concerned. Um, because these are frontline workers. And while we're doing things that I think we hadn't done before, but we think the science is good behind them, like disinfecting and reusing a mask, um, that makes frontline people nervous, and, and rightfully so. So I want to acknowledge that we're trying to strike that balance. And I, I just ask everyone again, when we make a decision not to social distance, when we make a decision to not wear a mask and be in close contact with one another, that puts more pressure on the PPE supply and the folks at the hospital that puts people like Mary's and thousands of others at more risk. And so um, in balancing this again, this is I'll go back before I go to questions. It's that simmering pot. We could turn it down and have it flat. If we locked everybody down, we know that that wasn't sustainable. We could let everybody go back to what they're doing and it would boil over and we'd see what's happened elsewhere. Or we can try and use science our best analysis and a collaborative effort to keep it just below the boil with as much open to provide economic opportunities, health, both physical and mental, and then some of the joys in life um, that, that are found. And so with that, we'll be glad to answer any questions. I'd like the commissioners to be ready on the details. Dave, you want to start? 
Yeah, I didn't hear anything about. And we are going to move away from this press conference as the Q&A section begins. The big headline here, June 1st, marking the next phase of reopening in Minnesota. Governor Tim Walz calling this step not perfect, but he says it is safe and included in that step on June 1st. Bars and restaurants will be allowed to reopen to outdoor dining with some restrictions. One of those restrictions being that workers are required to wear a mask. And also on June 1st, personal care services, things like hair salons, nail salons, barber shops, tattoo parlors, also allowed to open, but at a reduced capacity, 25% of what's allowed by fire code. So we'll have much more on this announcement coming up tonight on Live at 5 and of course on our website, WXOW.com. Thank you for watching this update.